Welcome everyone uh, to Bite Medicine's 28th webinar. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Azim. I'm one of the co-founders of Bite Medicine. Um, we've been running a bunch of free webinars during um, quarantine and COVID. So uh, thank you so much for you guys for being here today for this very special, fantastic lecture uh, webinar by Dr. Hudson Peacock. Um, so thank you so much for being here today. Uh, Dr. Hudson Peacock, um, we're, we're so, so grateful and I'm sure you have some fantastic stories to tell us. So before we dive into my proper introduction, just a few housekeeping bits and pieces. Um, as I'm sure you guys probably know by now, we offer certificates um, for attendance at each of our webinars. So if you just fill out the feedback form um, at the end of the presentation, you will receive your certificate from our friends at Medigate. Um, there's a slight backlog because I think we have a few thousand certificates to be processed. So thank you for your patience with that. Um, of course, please tell your friends, tell your family about us. The only way we can continue doing these is people keep attending. So uh, we'd be really, really grateful for that as well. Um, so yeah, without further ado, if uh, you could pop onto the next slide, Nathan, I will give you my extravagant introduction. Um, so everyone, we are absolutely honored today to have uh, Dr. Hudson Peacock with us. Um, he's an expedition doctor, junior doctor in London, um, with special interest in critical care anaesthetics. Um, and he has an absolutely fantastic Instagram page, which is where I first stumble upon him. Um, he has some absolutely incredible experiences traveling to places like the Himalayas and really all around the world. Um, so it's an absolute pleasure to have you here today, Nathan. Thank you for taking your time to be with us um, for this very interactive and what looks like a very fun lecture. Um, in an area which isn't really covered in the medical syllabus. So um, yeah, I think it's going to be really, really exciting and we're all going to be learning a lot. So thank you once again for being here today, Nathan. Absolutely. Hey, thank you very much for the, that introduction. Um, welcome to everyone. Uh, it's really exciting to have so many people here. Um, I think there's currently about 200 people watching. So a um, little bit nerve wracking for me, uh, but hopefully it will give you something to think about going forwards and tell you a little bit about expedition medicine. Um, in particular, I just wanted to start a little bit about myself. Um, you'll realize that this topic obviously doesn't come up usually in the medical curriculum and that a lot of the things that we'll be covering today aren't things that will come up in your exam. Um, so with that in mind, it might be a slightly different format to what you're used to. I'm going to have some case studies in there, but I'm not going to be focusing too much on specific drug names and, um, and doses and, and things like that, just because it's not particularly useful. And this is more about an introduction to expedition medicine, in particular high altitude medicine. Um, hopefully it'll make you think a bit about, a bit outside the box. Um, medicine is very prescriptive in terms of your career and your training. Um, but there are so many phenomenal opportunities within medicine. So hopefully this just uh, piques a bit of interest for you and gives you a bit of information about altitude medicine and makes you think about what you might want to do with your own careers as you move forward. Um, obviously, this is mostly targeted at medical students, but there probably are some people who are maybe doctors or even not at all medical. Um, and that is absolutely fine. You are welcome to stay. And there isn't going to be too much terminology. And if there is any terminology, I'll make sure to explain it. So, um, firstly, just a little bit about myself. Uh, my name's Nathan. I'm, uh, I'm a junior doctor working in London. I'm currently an F4, so that's two years out of training. Um, and I've been doing expedition medicine for the last two years. Uh, I've been on uh, eight or nine expeditions to date now from uh, Pakistan, Nepal, India, Ecuador, Tanzania, Cambodia, Morocco. So all over the place. So I'll talk a bit mostly on the, the high altitude stuff today. Um, so just, just before we get started though, I want to firstly get everyone to have a little think about your own medical journey so far, if you're a medical student or a doctor. Um, I'll tell you a bit about mine. So at the age of five, I went to primary school, as a lot of people do. I hit 12, I went to senior school, I didn't take a gap year, I went straight to university and from university I went into F1 and I went in, into F2. And suddenly, 20 years of my life, I had always known what the next step was. Every single year, I knew what was happening in August. I knew that I'd be going to senior school or going to university or starting F1 or starting F2. Um, 
so I was, I was basically just going through life on the treadmill. Um, the next step was always planned in advance and I always knew what was coming next. Um, and I think this is the situation a lot of medical students find themselves in, especially with a career like medicine, where we're very goal focused. We're all about exams and we're all about being competitive to make sure we you know, get that consultant job we want, get onto the specialty training program that we want. Um, and sometimes it's, it's very easy to become a bit blinkered and focused on the treadmill. And we sometimes um, forget to think about the wider picture. And sometimes actually just taking a moment to step off the treadmill allows us to look around and find out what else is available. Because if you spend your whole life on the treadmill, you might never know that actually you freaking hate the treadmill and you much prefer the rowing machine or something like that. So um, just running with that analogy, um, I've been, th these are, this is a sort of small graphic that shows a few of the places I've, I've been. So in London, um, as an F2, I was, I was doing a, a job in community drug and alcohol and I um, <laughs> rather cheekily fancied doing a bit of skiing and I'd used up all my annual leave so I ended up googling uh, conferences and ski resorts and I came across one on expedition medicine and um, I, I thought great I'll, I'll go on that course didn't really know much about expedition medicine at that point um, but I went on the course and um, got my skiing in and yeah the first speaker was someone called Lucille Belensky and she um, is a GP but she also does Two days a week, uh, two days a month on the air ambulance. She works part time in A and E. Uh, she works uh, in a global health clinic in Kenya, and she is also David Attenborough's expedition doctor. And so my mind was blown. Like I had no idea um, this kind of career was possible within medicine. Um, you know, I'd been very much on top of the sort of you know going through medical school, trying to do well in exams and all of that, without really thinking about actually what. What does being a doctor in your 20s and 30s look like um, and how can you make it work for you? So since then, I've been all over the world. You might, might have seen, um, I was meant to be going to Mirror Peak in, in October, uh, the one that's on screen now, but unfortunately that's been canceled due to coronavirus. Um, so how do I get to the next slide? Here we go. Fine, so I've talked a bit about the treadmill. Just have a think about what your own treadmill is and just think about how you might be able to find what your rowing machine is. So without further ado, just gonna crack on. So, um, scenario one, imagine it's three o'clock in the morning, you're five and a half thousand meters up at altitude and the climber in front of you looks unsteady. What do you do? Have a think about that. There's another, another case that we'll talk about later. So it's um, five o'clock in the morning, you've been up since, midnight um, in the pitch black with your head torch on you've got the crampons on your feet you can see down at the bottom of the picture there those are the spiky things that you strap onto your boots to mean you don't slip on the ice and you've been climbing for the last four or five hours seeing the most incredible sunrise and you're just a couple of hundred meters away from the summit but your buddy is really complaining of shortness of breath he's really really struggling what do you do um and uh, oh it's a little video here and those are the conditions you're in. It's pretty windy. Um, so there you go. And here, here's another case for you to think about as we go through. So you've just summited Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, it's nearly 6,000 meters of altitude and you've arrived back at base camp. You know, you had a successful summit and you know, everyone's uh, exhausted, but feeling really positive about having made the summit. Um, your tent partner says that they have a pounding headache and they're feeling shivery. And you're thinking, well, I've just, we've just summited. Um, you know, do, we, do we need to evacuate? What do we do? So these are the kind of questions and situations you might be faced with when you're um, an expedition doctor. And hopefully going through some of these cases and some background today will give you some idea as to how you might approach these situations. Um, it's important to know that this isn't textbook medicine. There is never any one size fits all. And that's one of the most exciting things about expedition medicine is that everything is situation specific. You know, in that exact same situation, your answer might be different if it is cloudy, if it's rainy, if it's the middle of the night, if it's the daytime, um, if, you're, if you have phone signal, if you don't. So it's, it's a forever changing beast and it's really exciting um, field to be working in. So um, these are the kind of things we're gonna be talking about. Uh, we're going to be talking specifically about high altitude medicine with a focus on emergencies. Uh, this 
just to give you a bit of background on all the photos, all the photos throughout this whole, and videos throughout this whole presentation are photos that I've taken on expeditions over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, so this photo is of one of our guides in Ecuador, just near the summit of Cotopaxi, uh, which is one of the uh, volcanoes in Ecuador, which is 5,897 meters high. Um, so firstly, we're just going into some definitions, and I've tried to avoid using too many numbers and too much text on the slides, just because, uh, as I said, uh, this is more to pique your interest and give you a bit of background information. It's not to make you, you know, do well in your exams, because these kinds of questions aren't going to come up. However, if we're going to be talking about altitude, we need to set some basic definitions and kind of put things into perspective for you guys. So firstly, what is high altitude? High altitude, um, you could think of as a general term, meaning you know, you're high up, um, but actually it is a specific category and it refers to altitudes above two and a half thousand or 2,400 meters. Um, so examples of that might be the higher ski runs in Alpine ski resorts. So if you think Teen in France and Valterrand, the two highest resorts in, in the Alps, they're around 2,000 meters. So when you're going up to the higher ski runs, you'll be, you'll be in the high altitude category. Um, next, category is very high altitude, which is more than 3,600 meters. So that's when you're looking at mountains such as Mount Tupcal, uh, which is the highest mountain in North Africa, so at 4,167 meters. Or if you've ever been to Chamonix, uh, there's a cable car there called the Aiguille du Midi, and that gives you access to the Vallée Blanche ski run, and that's at 3,842 meters. Uh, so uh, that's pushing into the very high altitude territory. The last official category is extremely high altitude. So that's when you're going above five and a half thousand meters. And this is really, really, uh, really high, <laughs> as the clues in the name, extremely high altitude. Uh, but that's looking at Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, a few of the seven summits, that's the highest mountain on each continent, fall into the same category of extremely high altitude. Um, there is one more category, and it's not an official category, but it's one that is referred to a lot um, in um, popular culture and in social media and all of that. And that's called the death zone. Um, and that's when you go above 8,000 meters. Uh, so there are only 14 mountains in the world that are higher than 8,000 meters. And obviously Mount Everest is the tallest one at 8,848 meters. Uh, the reason it's called the death zone is because it's the, it's high enough altitude that means no human could survive there without supplemental oxygen. It's not to say that humans can't go above there temporarily, without oxygen and indeed lots of people have summited Mount Everest and other 8,000 is without supplemental oxygen but no human could survive there for a prolonged period of you know several days without without oxygen. Um, so as I mentioned there, there are 14 mountains above 8,000 meters and um, the highest being uh, Mount Everest um, and if you're interested in this kind of thing there's a chap called Nims uh, so on Instagram he is Nims Dai N-I-M-S-D-A-I and he is this um, Nepali guy who joined the British Gurkhas and, and he accomplished an incredible feat last year. He climbed all 14 of the 8,000 meter peaks around the world in just six months. And the previous record was eight years. Um, and he's just got the most amazing photos and he's written a book and he's doing interviews. Thing. He's a really cool guy to follow, um, really inspirational. And one of the records he achieved, for example, is that he climbed Everest, Lhotse and Makalo three 8,000 meter mountains. He climbed all three of them in 48 hours. Like he's just an absolute machine. Um, so what happens as you go through these different altitude categories is that the amount of oxygen compared to sea level decreases. So it's really important distinction here. The, the, the concentration of oxygen in the air stays at 21% the whole time. It doesn't matter if you are um, at sea level or if you're on the top of Everest, the concentration is still 21%. However, because as you go up, the pressure goes down, a set volume of air will contain fewer molecules of oxygen. So for example, if you take one cubic meter of air at sea level, for sake of argument, say it contains 100 molecules of oxygen, which is 21% concentration. Um, if you go up to 5,500 meters, you take one cubic meter of air, it will only contain 50 molecules of oxygen. So from this um, explanation, we get this, these sort of oxygen percentages here. So that's the oxygen percentage versus sea level. So if we say sea level is 100%, which we know is 21% oxygen, um, in terms of the amount of oxygen, once you reach high altitude, you're about three quarters. 
once you reach extremely high altitude, you're up 50%. And once you're in the death zone, um, you have um, a relative amount of oxygen of about a third of what you have at sea level. Um, and it, that, that's the interesting thing about altitude. It's basically, it's this reduction in the amount of oxygen in the air, um, which we call the partial pressure of oxygen in the air, which is the same as the partial pressure of oxygen in your alveoli, which is your, the little sacs in your lungs and it's what you're breathing in. It's, the, it's that decrease in the oxygen you're breathing that leads to the problems associated with altitude, um, with specific um, reference to altitude sickness, um, rather than some of the other problems that go with altitude, such as hypothermia and cold and um, UV exposure and all of those other things. So um, that, that's a really important slide to take on board. Basically, the reason you get altitude sickness is because of the low oxygen. And so when it comes to um, treating altitude sickness, it's all about increasing the amount of oxygen they're getting. It's important not to forget, though, that there are, are other things happening at altitude. You're often in incredibly cold conditions. Um, when I was on the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro, the temperature was minus 36 degrees, um, we were told, uh, in terms of uh, Celsius. And that's before wind chill. Uh, the other thing is you have incredibly high UV exposure. Um, the sun is beating down, the atmosphere is thinner up there, and also you're getting a lot of reflection off the snow, so you're getting a, a double whammy, and sunburn is incredibly um, common. Uh, you might be physically exhausted because you're walking or climbing for several hours, sometimes 10, 20 hours in one day if it's summit push. Um, and there's other factors such as confined living space, you know, sleeping in a tent for a month or two sometimes, or, you know, um, Sometimes you have impaired personal hygiene because actually, you know, it's so cold, you can't get out of your long johns for a few days or you, you know, you don't have access to a normal flushing toilet and running water. You're collecting water from a river, for example. Um, and then dehydration. Uh, so one of the adaptations to going to altitude is um, that you, you pee quite a lot. Um, and that's because as you, uh, in your first sort of few hours, first few days of going to altitude, your body is trying to compensate for the lack of oxygen by concentrating your blood. And it sort of imposes this diuresis via the kidneys. And so during those first few days going to altitude, you're peeing constantly as your body is desperately trying to concentrate the blood to increase the hematocrit and improve oxygen delivery to the tissues. So these are all the other things that might be going on at the same time as altitude and, um, and the lack of oxygen. So it's really important not to forget those because actually all of those things can cause other problems which might also happen at altitude or you might even be more susceptible to at altitude um, such as infections and migraines. So that's a bit of the background. So we'll, we'll get on to talking a little bit about altitude sickness. Um, just before I do that one second. So altitude sickness, um, altitude sickness is a bit of an umbrella term. It's not a specific uh, condition. What it refers to is three separate conditions. Um, the first one is AMS, that's acute mountain sickness. Um, and that is uh, sort of the body's response to altitude. And it's very, very common, um, but it is reversible and it is largely preventable. Um, it's, it's things like headaches and feeling grouchy and feeling a bit nauseous, losing your appetite. And it happens usually to about a quarter of a people um, above two and a half thousand meters. It's very rare for it to happen to people below two and a half thousand meters. Um, and it affects a lot of people going up to altitude. It's almost more common than, it, than not. However, it is, it is preventable um, and treatable. Uh, and it usually comes down to uh, basically slowing down the ascent profile. So if you take longer to get to a certain altitude and take more days between changing altitude, it gives your body more time to catch up. So that's acute mountain sickness or AMS. Um, the next two conditions are what we call the high altitude emergencies. So that's high altitude cerebral edema or HACE, um, named after the American spelling of edema, and high altitude pulmonary edema or HAPE. Um, HACE and HAPE are both life-threatening emergencies if they are not treated um, and they yeah so they're, they're life threatening emergencies so, so they do need to be treated and, and they can be quite rapidly um, disastrous for example with high altitude pulmonary edema so that's where you're getting um, inflammation in the lungs is causing leakage of fluid and you're getting fluid pooling in the lungs 
if you were to stay at the same altitude, not give any treatment, not give any drugs, not give any oxygen, just stay at the same altitude, it can be fatal in as little as eight hours. Um, and it's, the timescales aren't too different for cerebral edema, which is where your brain starts to swell. Um, and we know from the, the Monroe Kelly doctrine that the skull is a fixed volume, it's a, it's a fixed volt. Um, and so when the brain starts to swell, uh, it can only swell to a certain amount um, as you know the venous blood is moved away and all of that stuff. It can only swell a certain amount before that brain has to give way and starts getting squeezed through the foramen magnum. And that can cause uh, coning and death fairly quickly as well. So three types of altitude sickness that you need to be aware of. AMS, which is the um, sort of treatable non-emergency one. Um, HACE and HAPE. It's important to note that HAPE is slightly separate to the other two, whereas HACE is usually uh, sort of a more severe form of AMS. So you can have HAPE without AMS, but you can't have HACE without AMS. So hopefully that, that all makes sense. So moving forwards, um, just wanted to go into a little bit more definition on these three conditions. So acute mountain sickness, AMS, um, it's, there, there, seems, there is sometimes some debate over how you define it exactly. However, there is um, a scoring system that is used for academic purposes um, called the Lake Louise score. It was actually updated in 2018 to reflect, uh, so before 2018, it included poor sleep as uh, one of its um, criteria, one of its points um, on, the, on the scale. However, they decided that actually poor sleep is so multifactorial that, um, that there's no point really including it. So they got rid of poor sleep. And what they said was that actually it's very rare to have AMS without a headache. So they've said that AMS is the Lake Louise score of three or more points from the four symptoms of headache, GI symptoms, fatigue and weakness, dizziness and lightheadedness, including having a headache and in the setting of a recent ascent or gain in altitude. Um, so generally they advise looking at these things around six hours after reaching the altitude and resting because if you do it straight away people might be have been exerting themselves, they might be dehydrated, they might be um, just exhausted so it, it might be sort of confounding on the actual score. So normally a few hours after ascending to altitude you can have a look at the score and uh, say whether someone has acute mountain sickness. However, this is, it's worth bearing in mind, this is a, a research tool. It's a diagnostic criteria used academically. In practice, this guides your diagnosis of acute mountain sickness. However, it's not black and white. You can sometimes have people who just have a headache um, that is persistent, but actually don't feel too fatigued or lightheaded or um, you know, nauseous. Um, and it's in the context of recent sense to altitude. And you would say, you know, they do have mild AMS. S similarly, you might have someone who's gone up to altitude and they have really bad nausea, absolutely no appetite. They're feeling exhausted. They're a bit lightheaded, but, you know, they don't have a headache at all. Um, and, you know, this person still has AMS. So it's not black and white, but this is a very useful tool. Um, and it allows some sort of standardization when it comes to um, research into acute mountain sickness. Um, so moving on to, uh, so I'm just gonna check the chat. Okay, there's, there's lots of things going on, on in the chat. I can't really keep focus on all of that at the same time. So what I'll do, I'll, there'll be time for questions at the end, okay. Um, so moving on to high altitude cerebral edema. Um, so essentially the, the easy way to think about it is that they've got symptoms of AMS, so headache, GI symptoms, fatigue, nausea, weakness, dizziness, but it's a severe form of that and they have a neurological finding. So basically with haste, the brain is swelling inside its closed uh, fixed volume and this is causing uh, pressure on certain areas which are causing a neurological symptom or, or sign. Uh, for example, that might include ataxia, there might be a change in mental state, and these are the most common findings you would have uh, with haze. The absolute typical presentation of haze is someone who has been complaining of a bit of a headache, losing their appetite, and then seems to become progressively a bit confused, possibly aggressive, um, and starts to have truncal ataxia. So that's as they're walking, they're swaying a lot from side to side. And actually, the, the, 
that the phenotype of someone with haze looks very similar to someone who's had a few too many drinks on a Friday night. Um, you know, they're confused, they might be slowing their speech, they might not know where they are, they might be vomiting, complaining of a headache, um, and they might be all over the place, ataxic. So that's the, the really key one to remember. If someone feels really unwell, but they don't look drunk, um, you know, it might just be AMS. But if they are complaining of feeling unwell with the headaches and they look drunk, then you should be thinking haste and you should be thinking that this is a high altitude emergency and you need to be doing something about it now. Um, so moving on to high altitude pulmonary edema. Um, high altitude pulmonary edema, this is where you get some fluid on the lungs. Uh, it's due to, uh, it's multifactorial, don't fully understand it, uh, but part of the thinking is that due to exertion and the lack of oxygen, it leads to uh, leaky capillaries and um, production of pulmonary fluids and you get pulmonary edema. So you get some of the same findings as you would find with pulmonary edema for any other cause at sea level. Um, for example, cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Um, and the real key here is shortness of breath at rest. So you'll see in notes from, a, from an expedition, if you're looking at medical notes, you might see S-O-B-A-R. So normally we talk about shortness of breath on exertion when we're at sea level, S-O-B-O-E. Actually at altitude, we often talk about shortness of breath at rest, S-O-B-A-R. And that's because at altitude, imagine if you're at five and a half thousand meters, you have 50% of the oxygen you would normally have available to you. Um, so everyone is out of breath when they're exerting themselves. Every single person is getting out of breath. And you know, it, it sometimes feels like a bit ridiculous. Like you can literally be taking four breaths per single step. You can be walking that slowly. That's how hard your body has to fight for oxygen. The real key though, is that with altitude, you'll be fighting hard for your breath when you're exerting yourself. But when you stop and rest, you know, after a minute, you might still be panting really hard to catch your breath like that. Um, but after five minutes, you'll be feeling a lot better. And after, after 10 minutes, you'll be speaking in full sentences again. And, you know, it might be that you change position or stand up um, and that makes you really out of breath again for 30 seconds. But generally, you're, you're getting back to sort of a fairly normal baseline. Um, the reason to worry is when you rest and then the shortness of breath isn't getting better. So five minutes later, you know, the rest of the, the group or your buddy, their, their shortness of breath is improving. They're talking in full sentences again. But that one person is still fighting for breath. And after five minutes, they're still fighting for breath and they can't complete their sentences. So that's your real warning sign. And another real warning sign is when someone can't keep up with the rest of the group. Um, if there's 20 odd people walking and you know one person is persistently arriving an hour, two hours behind, that can be an early warning sign as well. So the shortness of breath at rest is the initial, um, is the initial symptom. Um, but then you, they also might develop some, some signs such as a cough, which might be dry initially and it might be later productive of pink frontosputum. And they might find that their symptoms are worse when lying flat due to the pooling of fluid. In the same way that with um, cardiogenic pulmonary edema, you get orthopnea and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, you can get the same thing with high altitude pulmonary edema. And it is often quite, quite often the case that people sort of mask their symptoms a bit or they deny their symptoms a bit during the day because they don't want to appear weak or they don't want to you know, cause a nuisance on the exhibition. And then when they go to bed at night, they find that they're unable to lie flat, they're coughing, they're getting worse. And um, tragically, sometimes these people never wake up in the morning. So it's really, really, really important if you're going as a doctor on expedition to make sure your participants know that they have to be upfront with their symptoms and they should never hide anything. You're never gonna turn people around unless it's absolutely necessary. So that's a bit of information about AMS, haste and HAPE. So just a quick recap, AMS or acute mountain sickness uh, is quite, is very common. Uh, it's reversible, it's not an emergency. Uh, AMS, when it's severe and causes you neurological findings such as ataxia or confusion, that's known as high altitude cerebral edema or haste, and that is a life threatening emergency. And separately to those two is HAPE, your high altitude pulmonary edema, which again is a life threatening emergency. So, I'm just gonna have some water, excuse me a second. 
So you might remember this slide. I said the key with altitude sickness is the lack of oxygen um, being delivered to the alveoli and therefore the lack of oxygen getting to the around the body and to the tissues. Um, so this is really important because it guides our treatment. And essentially it means that our treatment is always to descend. So, and that descent can be by any means necessary. So this is a short video of me descending from, of me descending from Mount Tukal in Morocco. Um, this is a descent from Mount Kilimanjaro. So you can descend on foot, you can descend on helicopter, um, really by whatever means you can to get down. And if you can't go on foot and you can't go by helicopter um, and you don't have a, a mule or a horse available, sometimes you need to use a stretcher. So these are some of the stretchers that are used on Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, you'll see they've got a sort of quite a funny design where there's basically one wheel on suspension in, in the middle. And you, you can see that it's quite nasty terrain. So these, these stretches here are kept at about 4,300 meters. Um, and this is an evacuation we did at two o'clock in the morning or maybe three in the morning off the side of Kilimanjaro. And you can see it's the middle of the night. Um, and you know, as I said, the treatment is descend. And so it doesn't matter how you're gonna do it, whether it is by helicopter on foot or by stretcher in the middle of the night or by donkey, the treatment is always to descend. So altitude sickness is really simple, isn't it? You just have to descend. Well, this is where it really gets interesting because what if you can't descend? What if the weather is bad and you can't get a helicopter? And what if you aren't anywhere near a stretcher or there aren't enough of you to operate a stretcher? Or what if you can't descend because you are so out of breath that you, you know, or you're so ataxic you can't even stand up? This is where expedition medicine gets really interesting. This picture is taken in uh, northern Pakistan last summer. Um, it's just along the, the bank of the Indus River and it's the, it's the second day of the trek going towards K2 base camp and the Gondagora La Pass, uh, of which I've got some pictures later. Um, however, you can see that this path is very, very narrow. You could never get a stretcher down here. Um, and the other, the other interesting thing is that the whole of this trekking region and climbing region in Pakistan is all a militarized zone. And Pakistan and India have been in conflict for quite some years, and it's almost impossible to get a helicopter evacuation because you have to ask the Pakistan military. Um, so if you imagine you're, you know, a few days into the trek and you have an emergency and you want a helicopter, you know, getting a helicopter is difficult at the best of times, but when you need to call from somewhere with no phone signal using a satellite phone, to an insurance company in the UK, get them to speak to the UK embassy, to speak to the Pakistani embassy, to get them to, to mobilize one of their military helicopters to pick you up. You can imagine this isn't a particularly easy process um, and you might end up waiting several days. In this case as well, the, the start point of the trek is already uh, nearly 4,000 meters. So you can't descend on foot very easily um, to a low altitude. So the evacuation plan from K2 base camp if you can't get a helicopter, is a seven day donkey ride back the way you came. So it's really important to, to know the environment you're going into, to know, the, um, to know what your evacuation options are. Because on somewhere like Kilimanjaro or Everest Space Camp, you know, getting a helicopter is very, very easy unless the weather conditions are, um, don't allow it. But somewhere like Northern Pakistan, it's much more difficult. And so this, helps you risk assess when you're screening your participants, but also planning what medical kit to take, um, you know, planning on what, whether, how much oxygen you need to take, whether you need to take a gamo bag, what drugs you need to take, um, what kind of communication devices you need to take. So these are all the, the bits of expedition medicine that make it really, really interesting and exciting and means no two days are the same. So um, I mentioned a few bits there. Um, if you can't descend, um, and remember, the first priority is always descend. But if you can't, then you've got a few little bit of tricks that, that you can uh, keep on you. So on the left of the screen there, you can see bottled oxygen. Um, and so oxygen, as, we decide, as we've said already, is the main cause for the development of altitude sickness, one of those three that I mentioned. 
So giving oxygen can often very effectively treat uh, the problem. However, you've got to bear in mind that oxygen will run out. You can't carry unlimited amounts of oxygen. You can't just plug it into a wall like you're in a hospital. Um, so you need to bear that in mind um, and always use the, the slowest flow rate you can possibly get away with to alleviate the symptoms or, or get a, a SATs up to what you expect. So a normal oxygen saturations when you're tracking around 5,000 meters or so, you might have an oxygen saturations of about 81%, 82%. It might be as low as 70, 75%. You might be having an oxygen saturation of 90%. Um, the, the oxygen saturations fluctuate a lot because if you remember your bore curve, uh, your hemoglobin dissociation curve, um, essentially when you're at a high PO2, it sort of, you know, a significant change in PO2 doesn't lead to much of a change in your saturations. However, once you get to the slightly next bit of the curve, um, just a small change in PAO2 leads to a significant change in your oxygen saturations. So um, actually a, a, a saturation of 80% or 70% versus 90% actually might not be that different in terms of the actual amount of oxygen uh, in your bloodstream. Um, and it's also important to bear that in mind because actually a lot of people place a lot of emphasis on what the oxygen saturations are at altitude. Um, but they really don't mean a thing in isolation. You really need to compare them with the rest of the group. So, you know, if everyone in the group has an oxygen saturation of 88% and one person has an oxygen saturation of 62%, you know, that's ringing some alarm bells. Um, but equally, if they look totally fine, they're keeping up the group, they're not getting out of breath, they're recovering quickly, actually, you know, it's just a number and it might not be a reliable trace. So it always has to be taken into context. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is that you probably a lot of time won't be able to get an oxygen saturation because their finger might be under two, three pairs of gloves um, and it might be very cold and you don't want to take out the you know, bits of kit like that um, or take out their finger to expose them. Or in certain cases, they might be wearing nail varnish, which we had on Kilimanjaro. Anyway, so you, you've got oxygen uh, that's available to you. Um, it's a very, very, very good treatment option, but the downside is that it, it obviously isn't unlimited. Um, the big red inflatable thing that you see is what's known as a portable altitude tank chamber or a portable hyperbaric chamber or a gamo bag. Um, what that does is essentially uh, in, you put the, the patient inside, you zip it up, and then you use that fo foot pump you can see to inflate the bag. And what that does is it builds up pressure inside the bag such that the, the patient is getting an increased partial pressure of oxygen. Um, so when someone's in that bag, you can halve their, almost halve their effective altitude. So if they're at 5,000 meters, putting someone in that bag and inflating it fully will halve their effective altitude to roughly 2,500 meters. So um, this is, this is a, an option you can consider as a last resort. Lots of people put a lot of emphasis on this. Um, however, it is very much a last resort because uh, firstly, to get a benefit, people, the patient needs to be in there for quite a long time. Um, so that means you're delaying descent. Um, also, someone needs to be pumping that foot pump at all times to flush out the carbon dioxide they're producing and bring in air from the outside. The other thing to bear in mind is that uh, uh, it will be very cold in air. They might be vomiting. You can't access them. You, you know, it's, it's a very difficult way to be managing a patient. Um, and it's very labor intensive because someone needs to be there pumping the bag the whole time. And often they might need to be in there for a few hours. So the gamma bag really is a last, last, last resort. If you've, you know, you've, you, you don't have any way of descending whatsoever, perhaps you're caught in a blizzard um, and you can't descend or, um, you know, it's the middle of the night and you're, you've got a severe injury. So, and there's no, there's no helicopter, and no stretcher. So you, you can't descend. These are the situations where a gamma bag might be useful. The other thing to bear in mind is it's incredibly heavy, so it's more likely to be at, at a base camp as um, of sorts. So we talked about oxygen and gamma bags. The, the last bit in the middle is the, the drugs. And I don't want to spend too much time on this because um, you know, for a lot of people, this will never come up in your exams and I don't want to dwell on, on, on the drugs and everything. However, just to give a very quick oversight, so this is my uh, drug kit that I take up altitude. You can see it's in a silver lined uh, reflective case um, just to reduce the chance of drugs freezing up at altitude. Um, and just focusing here on the altitude one, so you've got dexamethasone up here. So for high altitude cerebral edema, um, 
or sometimes in the case of AMS as well, you can give dexamethasone um, and that ranges from the usual dose for high altitude cerebral edema would be eight milligrams initially via IM or IV route. Um, and that helps reduce some of the swelling so it can buy you time. But again, it's something that should be done in conjunction with descent. Um, uh, down at the bottom here, we've got dexamethasone tablets um, and we've got diamox. So diamox is acetazolamide. That is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and it is useful for essentially making your kidneys excrete bicarbonate, makes your blood slightly more acidotic and therefore stimulates you to increase your respiratory rate to blow out carbon dioxide. So by increasing your respiratory rate, you're improving your oxygenation. So Diamox is often used to, as a preventative or as a treatment for acute mountain sickness. Um, the jury is still out on whether or not it is always useful and certainly a lot of textbooks and consensus papers would recommend it sort of fairly routinely for acclimatization. However, I'm yet to meet a single person in the industry, including um, Kenton Cool, who's one of my, my, one of my friends I've met who's summited average 14 times now. I'm yet to meet anyone in the industry who uses it routinely for everyone going to altitude. So it's, uh, it's something we can talk a bit more about at the end if anyone has any questions. The, the last drug you can see here down here, nifedipine um, modified release. So that is on the other side of that um, medication case. And that is something you can use in high altitude pulmonary edema. Uh, it acts as a pulmonary vasodilator. So it, it, um, the idea being that because the whole lung is slightly hypoxic, a lot of the lung is vasoconstricting and uh, reducing the amount of blood flow to the lungs to capitalize on the oxygen that is available. So by vasodilating the pulmonary circulation, it's increasing the blood flow to the lung and um, hopefully increasing the oxygen delivery to the tissues. Again, there, there was a bit of talk about nifedipine as a use in coronavirus. So if anyone's got any uh, thoughts about that, then again, save that as a question for the end. We can come back to that. You'll also see on this kit, I've got ondansetron for sickness, uh, diclofenac, which could be a useful painkiller, though um, best usually avoid this at altitude. Um, you've got adrenaline and chlorphenamine for uh, anaphylaxis. Um, and got Penthrox there, which is an inhalational um, analgesic agent. Uh, it's very, very good. It's got a slight dissociative effect, but if someone really badly twists their ankle or breaks a limb or needs to be um, extricated from being trapped under a rock or something, giving Penthrox can be an incredibly quick and easy way um, of allowing you to do what could be a potentially very painful maneuver. So um, basically the, the key to managing any high altitude emergency is always to inform the expedition leader of the need to evacuate. That's because evacuating can take quite a lot of time. You call for help because you might need more people to um, actually get the casualty out of there. And you always descend as soon as possible, you descend as far as possible, you give oxygen and you give medication, but you never delay descent. So if, you're, if, give, if finding oxygen or getting the medication is going to delay your descent, then you don't do it, you just descend first, then you give oxygen, you give medication as and when, you can do it as part of the descent. The key is descend, and that's always the best option if possible. So we're moving on to some cases. So I'm sort of rattling through things, we've got a lot to get through. Um, so coming back to this one, so this 3 a.m., it's 5,400 meters altitude. The climate in front of you looks unsteady. So this picture is taken uh, just below the summit of the Gondogorila Pass. So from K2 base camp, so K2 is the second highest mountain in the world. It's the most technical um, of the 8,000 meter peaks and um, often called the Mountaineers Mountain. Uh, so it's K2 base camp is just a couple of days walk the other way from this photo. And we had been to K2 base camp. Um, we were there a few days before NIM summited actually. So that was pretty cool. And then we went over to the Gondogorila, the idea being that we climb over this pass and descend into the neighboring valley uh, to then have a few days walking down through this lush valley to get back to the exit point of the expedition. We set off at 10 p.m. Uh, well, going, going before that, we, we set off the morning before at uh, uh, 8 a.m. We walked for about six hours to get to the, the base camp before the Gondogorila pass. And we went to bed at about 6 p.m and got up at 10 p.m. for a quick dinner to set off into the night. It was a beautifully clear night, um, and this is about three o'clock in the morning, uh, 
just before sunrise and only about a couple of hundred meters away from the top of the pass, which is just on the top of that Serac you can see in the picture. So what is the approximate amount of oxygen at this altitude compared to sea level? And I've got a, a poll so you can uh, answer this question. Uh, if you go down to the bottom of the screen and click polling, uh, you should be able to answer the, the question there and I can share the results. So I'll give that about uh, 30 seconds or so. Awesome. I will end that there. I think most people are getting that right. So uh, the correct answer is 50%. So if you remember that chart from the start of the, the talk, um, once you hit about five and a half thousand meters altitude, your the effective amount of oxygen you're getting is about um, it's about half that you get at sea level. So that 10.5%, it is 21% for all of them, so maybe it's slightly misleading. That's an effective oxygen concentration of 10.5%. But what it's saying is that you know the concentration is still 21%, it's just that the partial pressure of oxygen is half that that you'd find at sea level. So what do you do next? Um, let's move on to question two, and you should be able to answer that now. This is very exciting. I've not used one of these polls before. <laughs> Okay, I'll stop that there. Um, so 40% uh, of you said take a history and examination and you would be correct. It's always the answer in everything uh, in medicine is to start by taking a history and examination unless it is a, um, a resuscitation scenario, in which case you do A, B, C, D, E. So in this case, um, people thought about uh, calling for a helicopter. Uh, well, as, so as I mentioned before, it, this is in Pakistan. Um, Calling for a helicopter might take you several days if you get one at all. So not necessarily an option here. And also you don't know why they're unsteady yet. You don't know if they're unsteady because they twisted their ankle earlier and they're just feeling a bit, you know, a bit sore in their ankle or they're unsteady because actually they're, you know, really tired because they didn't manage to sleep at all or anything like that. Um, again, you don't, you don't know the full picture yet. So you won't necessarily give them oxygen. Um, and in this case, uh, we actually didn't have any oxygen on us. So, um, that's something I can come back to later. It was an administrative cock up. <laughs> so um, yeah, the answer is take a history and examination. So in terms of the history then, um, watch the next poll, okay. So uh, they had a terrible headache, they feel exhausted, they vomited once, uh, you examine them, they appear confused, you ask them to walk in a straight line by drawing a line in the snow and they're, they're unable to follow the straight line and they're falling over multiple times. Um, you try to get some obs but you've got thick gloves on and you can't, find, can't feel a pulse or anything through your thick gloves and you get the pulse oximeter out but it's not giving you a reliable trace. So you don't have any observations. What is your diagnosis? Okay. Awesome. Let's end that there. So yeah, most of you said high altitude cerebral edema, haste, and you would be correct. Uh, the reason this is not AMS is because they are confused and they show signs of ataxia. Um, so we remember what haste is signs of symptoms of AMS plus a neurological finding and they look like a drunk person. So this person, they've got a headache, they're exhausted, they're vomiting, they're confused, they're falling over, you know, they look like a drunk person. So it's haste. Um, so um, here's a bit of background. It's minus 20 degrees Celsius, it's windy, you're about nine hours into the climb and you're just 100 meters from the top of the pass, after which the group will descend into the neighboring valley. You don't have any oxygen with you. You don't have a gamma bag with you but you do have your medical kit. So what is the best option um, for management of this patient? So option one, you push onto the summit to allow descent into the neighboring valley. You turn around and descend immediately. You give them dexamethasone and monitor before deciding. You call a helicopter and wait for evacuation. 
There are some people who absolutely love helicopters on this talk. And it, <laughs> as I mentioned before, if you called a helicopter, you'd probably be waiting there in the minus 20 degrees Celsius for several days. So um, not the best option here. Um, pushing on to the summit, not many people of you have uh, said that. Um, and that, that's good to hear. Um, you're only 100 meters from the summit, from the top of the pass, um, and you can descend into the Nova Valley. However, you don't know what's on the other side and you don't know how they're going to go in the next 100 meters. It turns out that going down the other side into the valley was a really, really difficult day. And it took us about another 10 hours until we got down and had to use ropes to climb down long scree slopes and everything. So, um, you know, if we were dealing with someone who was even more sick at that point, it would have been an absolute nightmare. We would have put the rest of the group at risk as well. Um, so the correct answer as everyone as most people have said there is to turn around and send immediately um, in this case giving dexamethasone and then monitor before deciding isn't quite right um, that is because this person has clear signs and symptoms of haste and the fact that they're already vomiting they're confused they're stumbling around these are all severe signs of um, they're all serious indications of haste and so it is an emergency and you want to be getting them down as soon as you possibly can so if the option was give dexamethasone and descend, then that would be a correct option. But you don't give dexamethasone and then monitor before making a decision. You want to, you want to get down as quickly as you can. So moving on to the next case, um, it's 5 a.m. Uh, it's 4,000 meters altitude. Uh, you're 200 meters from the summit of Mount Tupcal. So this is this is Mount Tupcal I did in November 2018, um, just after spending a week in the desert, actually. So I had to go to the marketplace and buy some, some new clothes. Um, and this is uh, the tallest mountain in North Africa, uh, 4,167 meters. So you're 200 meters from the summit of Mount Tupcal and your buddy is complaining of shortness of breath. Um, so what do you do next? Let us go on to the poll, launch poll. Let's see how many people want to call for a helicopter this time. Hey, a few already. So this time we're in Morocco, not Pakistan. So helicopter is probably a little bit easier. Okay. Yeah. As per usual, it's the next, the next step is always read the question. The next step is take a history and examination. In this case, um, he's complaining of shortness of breath. You don't want to descend immediately uh, because he might be fine. He might just be short of breath on exertion. Um, again, you don't know if you want to give oxygen yet because you don't know if he is just exhausted because of how hard he is working. You can see on that video how difficult it was. I'll play it again. You can see how hard work it is there climbing in those conditions. We had 80 kilometers an hour gust of winds. It was about minus 20 degrees again. Um, it's really hard work and you're at 4,000 meters where the oxygen is about 50 to 60 percent that at sea level. So it's unsurprising to feel out of breath. Again, you don't want to call for a helicopter because you don't have a clue what's wrong with them yet. And also because trying to land a helicopter on that bit of snow there is going to be very difficult. So um, what do you do next? You take history and you examine the patient. Excellent. So you, you take a history, he seems incredibly short of breath, is unable to complete sentences. However, after five minutes, his breathing is getting easier and he seems to be getting better. What do you do next? Brilliant. In the interest of time, I'm just gonna plow through these. So, um, yeah, that, that's correct. You, you could wait five more minutes and that will just make you extra confident that actually he was just short of, short of breath on exertion, but actually was not short of breath at rest. And that's the key difference in this case. So he was just short of breath in the same way that you were short of breath because um, it was such hard work. So you wait five more minutes, he feels absolutely fine and you carry on. Um, so you agree to continue, but at a steady pace. So one hour later, you're at 4,100 meters, you're uh, just under 100 meters from the summit of Mount Tupcal, and he stops again, complaining of shortness of breath. However, this time, after five minutes, he is still very out of breath, and he's unable to complete sentences. He's also started coughing. So what is your diagnosis now? Uh, 
Excellent. Getting lots and lots of the right answers there. So, uh, and that. So yeah, he, he's showing signs of how to pulmonary edema. So the key being here that he is short of breath at rest um, and he's developing a dry cough. If you were to lie him down on the snow there, you might find that his symptoms get a bit worse and he gets um, orthopnic. Um, his sats might get worse if you were to be able to test them when he was lying down. Um, it's not AMS here because he hasn't complained of any of the si symptoms of AMS. He's not complaining of a headache, he's not complaining of feeling sick, he's not complaining of feeling fatigued or dizzy. Um, it might be pneumonia, uh, but it's, it's, it's a possibility, but it's not the most likely here. Um, and pulmonary embolism, again, it's something that you need to consider because when you go to altitude, you're dehydrated and you're hypoxic, which are two very important risk factors for um, DVTs and PE. However, the most obvious answer here is hey. So, moving on to treatments. Uh, what, is, what is your treatment? Some people really like helicopters. <laughs> Great. So remember, the, the treatment is always descend as your first, uh, your first approach. So in this case, um, he has clear signs and symptoms of hate. As we mentioned before, it's a life-threatening emergency. If you stay at the same altitude and don't give any treatment, it can be fatal in as little as eight hours. Um, if you had an, an abundance of oxygen with you, you could give some oxygen and weight, but you wouldn't go any higher. Um, and so it's not a particularly useful option. You wouldn't wait for a helicopter because it might take a long time and it wouldn't be able to land there. And also from those conditions, it's far too windy to land a helicopter there. Um, you don't have a gamo bag there either. Um, there might be one down at the, the camp below, but a gamo bag would be far too heavy to be carrying on a summit push. So as per previously, the treatment is always to descend. Um, just a couple more slides on this. So you've just summited Mount Kilimanjaro. You're over the moon. Um, it's been a really hard night. You set off, you arrived in base camp at 7 p.m. You got three hours sleep and then you got up at 10 p.m. to then set off into the middle of the night and you've been walking for 13 hours now through the pitch black um, and you summited successfully and you get back down to the base camp and your tent partner says they have a pounding headache and is feeling very shivery. So, um, go to the next slide. What is your top differential at this point? High altitude headache, haste, meningitis, more information needed. High altitude headache being part of AMS there. Excellent. So, yeah, a lot of you are saying more information is needed, and that would be true. Um, it could very well be a high altitude headache. Um, it could be haste. It could be meningitis. You need a little bit more information, to be honest. Um, the things that make it slightly less likely to be um, haste or high altitude headache is the fact that it, he's, he's been to high altitude. He's coming down. It seems to be getting, getting worse. Um, so yeah, so when you take a history, it reveals that he's been feeling feverish for hours and he's finding the light bothersome. His headache has been getting worse since descending from the summit. So what is your top differential now? Excellent. So a lot of you there, there was a bit of a split. So some said high altitude headache, some said uh, high altitude cerebral edema. So it's meant to be an E on the end there. Some said meningitis, some said more information needed. Um, meningitis is a really important thing to, you don't want to miss it on an expedition. Just because someone's at altitude doesn't mean they can't get all of the usual common things. As mentioned there, you know, they might be sleeping in close quarters with others. They might be uh, exhausted and sort of more susceptible to infection. However, sometimes people can get headaches that do continue to get worse on the way down from, from the highest point because their body takes a few hours to catch up. Um, and people can feel really feverish when they've been exert, like, uh, exerting themselves for so many hours. Uh, and so actually, you know, it could be a high altitude headache and it could be haste. 
However, it could be meningitis. And obviously meningitis is something you don't want to miss. Um, so it's really important to think widely and think of all the possible differentials rather than just thinking of altitude. So uh, what should you do next? Question 11. This is your last question. Read all of the options before you answer. <laughs> Excellent. So you'd be correct. So as I said, it could be high altitude headache, it could be haste, it could be meningitis. So how do you treat all of those? Well, as with all things with altitude, you descend immediately. You give some oxygen and you give some antibiotics and that will have all bases covered and you can then get them out to medical facility um, to get properly checked out. Great, so that is all of the, the polling stuff done. So last few slides then, I know we're getting to um, towards the end of the hour. So essentially uh, just a couple of very quick cases. So this was um, in the Zara Valley in India. Uh, again, it was a militarized zone, no helicopters available. The chap on the left, he said that uh, he woke up in the morning, this was third day at 5,000 meters, woke up in the morning saying he didn't really feel like breakfast. Um, he'd been one of the fittest in the group. He'd been at a higher altitude the previous day. But yeah, he woke up, said he didn't really feel like breakfast, had a bit of a headache and said he didn't feel quite well enough to go back down to the base camp at this point. And that's what set off alarm bells. Um, so I was just passing this group and I advised them, uh, they had a doctor with that group, I advised them, it's probably best to give dexamethasone and get going now, just in case this becomes more obviously haste in due course. Um, they decided to go, they decided that he actually didn't have any sort of clear cut signs of haste at that point. Um, although he had a headache and was feeling a bit sick and feeling a bit meh, they decided he didn't have any um, hard signs of haste and therefore they were going to watch and wait. So anyway, two hours later, I was coming back down past the same group and they, they hadn't moved and the same chap had deteriorated significantly to the point where he was now completely confused, had no idea where he was, had no idea who anyone was, was completely unable to stand up and had been vomiting continuously. And that's the difference that two hours can make. He had full blown haste, which is a life threatening emergency. However, in this case, he was um, a three hour walk away from the base camp. Uh, there was no helicopters available. Uh, we had oxygen, which was with another group, and there was a stretcher back at base camp. So he was unable to evacuate um, on foot other than with two people under each arm. But at five and a half thousand meters, that's exhausting for the other people who are helping him. So what we decided to do, we, we had the medical kit with us. We immediately gave him dexamethasone, IV, eight milligrams, put someone under each shoulder, and we started them descending immediately. During this time, we called the other groups for help and got some people to come, uh, bring a stretch and bring the oxygen, which we put him on at this point. And we then had to continue um, back down uh, towards the base camp, which was at 4,800 meters. On the right, you can see base camp just in, in the distance. There's a, there's a truck there and there's a nice glacial fast flowing river just before it. So just another additional uh, factor as part of the evacuation, we had to get him on oxygen and in a stretcher and sort of with reduced GCS across that river, which was very interesting. But luckily we had a, an international whitewater rescue expert with us to help coordinate that. Um, we eventually got him to the, the Jeep, uh, which is at 4,800 meters. And then he was feeling much better at that point already. So just a couple of hundred meters makes a big difference. Um, and the dexamethasone in the auction, but then he had an eight hour drive then over a high altitude mountain pass down to the nearest town, which was an eight hour drive away. Um, so that, those are the kind of things you wanna be considering when, it, when you're thinking about your evacuation options. Um, in this case, you know, the evacuation was so difficult that my, my threshold for calling evacuation was much lower. Um, and I was saying to get going sooner, um, but the, the decision was delayed that was out of my hands. So we ended up in a, in a less ideal situation, but he was absolutely fine. So that's good news. Um, so remember, always inform the expect expedition leader of need to evacuate, call for help, descend, give oxygen, give medication, but most importantly, never delay the ascent. So the key to any expedition is preparation leads to success. So you need to know what are your treatment options? What are your evacuation options? And then uh, that can lead to you preparing your kit appropriately and uh, having a successful expedition. This is a little picture of some yak cheese for sale. So it's just to say that things aren't always the uncommon things. 
um, do remember the common things as well that can happen at sea level, such as your meningitis. So just wrapping up, uh, these are some useful resources. Uh, on the left, it's a paper published in 2019, the Wilderness Medical Society Clinical Practice Guidelines for Prevention and Treatment of Altitude Sickness. You can find it on PubMed. And the book on the right that I take on all my expeditions with me. Um, so if you're a medical student, you want to get involved with some altitude sickness stuff, uh, sorry, with some expedition medicine stuff, get involved with your Wilderness Medical Society, brush up on your first aid skills. So volunteer with the Red Cross or St. John's Ambulance, go on some expeditions. And after you qualify, um, the most useful rotations are A&E and GP, get your ALS, get your ATLS and go on a wilderness medicine course. Um, I did one with wilderness medical training and I teach on the world extreme medicine courses. Um, so uh, either of those are great options. And before you know it, you'll be lying under the stars and seeing views like this, which is a time-lapse video I took of the Milky Way in India last summer. Uh, just from that base camp, actually, we were just looking at. Great. So two quick announcements, and I'll take questions. Firstly, at eight o'clock tonight, so in two hours' time, I will be doing an Instagram Live with Daniel. He's a, a doctor who is um, practicing aviation medicine. So he's always flying around the world uh, doing retrievals, and aviation often practicing medicine in the back of a private jet. So we'll be chatting at eight o'clock tonight on Instagram Live, um, talking about some of the cases I mentioned, talking about some of his really exciting work, so don't miss out. And lastly, um, I just wanted to mention this charity called UOK Doc. Uh, basically, it's a really horrible statistic, is that two healthcare professionals commit suicide every single week in the UK alone. In fact, in England and Wales, not even including Scotland and Ireland. Um, so today I've launched this campaign to make uh, everyone think about their own mental health, uh, think about what you can do on a daily basis to look after your mental health. Um, for example, um, thinking today I will ride a bike or I'll read a book or I'll call a friend. So every day thinking, what can I do to look after my mental health? And as part of this campaign, um, want you to we're asking people to donate to UOK Doc, which aims to provide mental well-being services to. Uh, doctors on the front line and hopefully other healthcare professionals in time soon. So if you want to donate, the QR code's on the right there. Otherwise, if you want to get involved with the campaign, which are, it would be amazing if you do, um, all the information is on my Instagram page. And that is it. My contact details are there and I'm happy to take some questions. I'm sorry that's run over a little bit in terms of time. Uh, so we'll do 10 minutes of questions. If you need to run off, I won't be offended at all. Um, and yeah, thank I'll start having Thank you, Nathan. Just before you dive into the questions, I just wanted to thank you personally. Absolutely incredible lecture. I learned so, so much, and I'm sure the hundreds of people who turned up also learned a lot. And the amazing charity you've set up as well sound, sounds brilliant. And um, once this goes on our website, I'm sure many hundred are going to tune in over the next few weeks as well. Um, so yeah, I'll let you dive into the Q&A and take any questions that you see in the chat. And thank you once again. Excellent. Um, Fine, wow, there's absolutely loads of questions on that. I will just start at the top and start scrolling through very quickly. Um, lost my mouse. Okay, where are we at? Fine, uh, so yes, it will be recorded. Bite Medicine are going to be uploading them afterwards uh, through bitemedicine.com slash watch. Why do you climb at 3 a.m.? So the environmental conditions are often um, quite unstable. So your risk of avalanche, risk of, risk of adverse weather conditions such as wind um, and snowstorms, they're often higher risk during the day when the temperatures rise. When the temperature is lower during the night, um, everything is frozen, the weather is more stable, um, and it allows you to, to basically minimize the risk from environmental conditions. So when the ground is melting during the day, you are higher risk of avalanche and things like that. So that's why we climb during the night. Uh, you also need to climb early to ensure you're in adequate light for summit. Uh, true as well, um, uh, but not always the case because obviously we're climbing during the night when there's no light, so you can use your head torches. Um, I mentioned bore and oxygen association curves, Mount Everest, eight, four, eight, four, six. Uh, I give you really, um, Ah, someone mentioned about ideal DMD is so breathtakingly gorgeous, you don't even notice the low oxygen. That is true for most people, not true for everyone. Um, David Attenborough, at the start of his uh, Planet, uh, Planet Earth 2, I think, he had a, a scene with the hot air balloon going over the Alps. Uh, the initial uh, plan was to film that from the top of the ideal DMD, but he started showing signs of 
altitude sickness and low oxygen saturations there and they had to go back down to the midpoint. So it's not okay for everyone. <laughs> that is public knowledge, I think. Anyway, um, Nims die, yes, yeah, so N-I-M-S-D-A-I. He did three and 48 hours, indeed, absolute machine. Um, you guys can get to the fridge, I'm not sure what that is, <laughs> you say. Um, so some people talk about altitude training to improve. So there are some masks you can use to reduce oxygen intake at sea level, for example, the Altitude Center in London. Um, there is evidence for intermittent hypoxic exposure if you're doing it regularly in the run-up to going to altitude, but the most evidence, uh, it, the evidence is still a little bit sketchy for that. Uh, there is some decent evidence and anecdotes about people using hypoxic tents that you sleep in at night. So you put a tent around your bed, it reduces the oxygen during the night and allows you to sort of start the climatization process before you actually go on expedition. Uh, talked a little bit about diamox and dexamethasone. Uh, someone's put some nice stuff about EPO. Um, lots of technical things in there, which is excellent. Can you not descend slowly? You don't need to descend slowly. You can descend as quickly as you like. It's not like in diving medicine where you have to ascend slowly. Uh, with altitude, you just get down as quickly as you can. Um, how heavy is all of that stuff? Good question. A lot of it's very heavy, and so you need to balance your risk with um, what you can actually carry and how many porters you've got in the group, for example. You recommend someone looking to climb an extremely high mountain engage with altitude training at lower altitude before attempting. Um, Absolutely. I would say don't go and climb a mountain uh, that is as high as Mount Everest or Kilimanjaro if it's your very first time going to altitude. Try and build up. So, you know, ski resorts, thinking about Mount Tupcal is a really nice introduction. You can do it in a five-day round trip from the UK uh, in Morocco, just a couple of days expedition. And you've seen a few pictures and videos from Mount Tupcal there. If you do it in summer, the conditions are glorious and it's, it's not too bad a trek at all. Um, <clears throat> Kilimanjaro is uh, fantastic as well. Um, it is not too dangerous as long as you're sensible. It's all of these mountains are dangerous when um, people are fixated on reaching the summit and are unwilling to turn back when the time is right. Um, so the, the key with Kilimanjaro that does make it a very popular mountain is that it's, it's a volcano. So there's pretty much always an easy descent option, whether that's on one of the stretches. Um, and there's oxygen um, scattered around the mountain, should be with your group as well. Uh, you can often get helicopters to help and there's good communications. There's usually radio stations, satellite phones and WhatsApp signal on, on Kilimanjaro. Um, 